Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we are going to go ahead and start our conversation about Inspire as an alternative CPAP as an alternative to CPAP therapy. We have with us this evening, Dr. Richir Patel, who's the medical director of the Insomnia and Sleep Institute of Arizona. And he's gonna discuss this incredibly exciting topic with us. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, so if you have a question during the presentation, this shows you how to ask, just hover your mouse over the lower half of your screen. You'll see a QA and a button, click on that. You just go ahead and type your question in there. And then myself and Dr. Patel will be the only ones that can see the questions. So at this time, Dr. Patel, I would like to turn the presentation over to you to discuss Inspire. Okay, great. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So let's quickly review obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea, in essence, is basically obstruction of the upper airway. If you're able to see my arrow here. This is the region of the throat that we're referring to, right? So as a side view of individuals sleeping on their back, there's the lips, the mouth. This right here is the tongue. This is gonna be the hard palate and then the soft palate. This little tip here would be the uvula and there's your nasal passage here. So in essence, what's happening is when we go to sleep because of muscle relaxation occurs throughout the whole body, but especially in the tongue, the soft palate and other areas in the head and neck area, this region here can either completely obstruct or partially obstruct. And obviously if there's a blockage partial or complete, you can't get air in and that's gonna cause repetitive drops in oxygen and create all slew of issues. So it's estimated that over 20 million Americans have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. So it's quite a prevalent condition. This little graph here shows what an apnea actually is. So you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, that an individual is having a pause in their breathing. And as a result of lack of airflow coming in, the individual has a drop in oxygen that can last for up to 47 seconds in this episode here. You can see they drop down to 84%. Normal during sleep, oxygen should remain 88% and above. And the second episode you can see was almost 90 seconds long where they had even a more significant drop in oxygen all the way down to 74%. Obviously that's very concerning because this is what contributes to increasing risk of atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmias, heart attacks, stroke, and even Alzheimer's disease. So what are the health risks associated with untreated sleep apnea? Well, obviously snoring affects the bed partner, uh, can obviously cause uh, issues amongst uh, family members just because of poor quality sleep and being tired and irritable. Fatigue, diminished productivity, obviously daytime sleepiness, inability to stay focused at work, uh, that all can contribute to a reduced production and uh, just difficulty functioning when working. Of course, motor vehicle accidents, so drowsy driving is an extremely common cause of motor vehicle accidents these days, which is resulting in obviously significant uh, mortality. Obviously, uh, we've all seen uh, news reports of bus drivers and train conductors that are also untreated with sleep apnea and they're falling asleep and obviously it's quite dangerous. And as mentioned earlier, there's a lot of heart and brain health consequences with not having sleep apnea successfully treated. So the gold standard therapy for sleep apnea since 1981 has been, a, has been CPAP therapy. So CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. It in essence provides positive air pressure to as you're breathing with it, it helps to keep the back of the throat, which I showed earlier, it helps to keep it open. So it provides excellent results for treating sleep apnea and also symptomatic improvements when it's used regularly and comfortably. But CPAP can be challenging for many patients that can cause them to have a hard time adapting to it. A lot of individuals may even have claustrophobia issues or some individuals just can't find a mask that fits well to the contours of their face and that makes it challenging for him or her to be able to use it successfully. So that unfortunately is a reality for us in sleep medicine is that not everyone is able to tolerate CPAP therapy successfully. Of course, the risks of untreated sleep apnea are quite severe and thus that's a challenge for us in sleep medicine is how do we treat these individuals with moderate to severe sleep apnea that can't tolerate CPAP therapy, unfortunately. Alternate therapeutic options right now are including a mouth guard. So this image here on the upper right shows an example of a mouth appliance that dentists make. You can see that it's molded to upper teeth and the lower teeth. The lower portion is in essence is locked forward. So it gets you to sleep with the lower jaw thrusted forward a bit. And in essence, it's trying to keep the tongue and the jaw from relaxing backwards and obstructing the throat or airway, but it's not as successful because you can only hold a person's jaw forward only in a few millimeter increments, and it may not be enough to still completely keep the throat open. And it's generally not 
extremely effective in individuals with moderate and severe obstructive sleep apnea. And then of course, there is a potential risk of creating TMJ issues and even bite changes. Then of course, upper airway surgery was performed by ENT for many years, uh, where it involved removing a part of the uh, uvula, even trimming down the base of the tongue, even there's jaw manipulation surgeries that in essence would you know, move the, the jaw forward to try to physically stretch open the airway. Unfortunately, these surgeries are A, very painful, B, they weren't very effective. And then 2010, we, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommended not to consider these as primary treatments for snoring and sleep apnea. I have had thousands of patients that have had these surgeries done and unfortunately, majority of them still snore and all of them still have sleep apnea. So now let's come to the topic of the discussion this evening, which is inspired therapy. So inspired, inspired therapy, also known as hypoglossal nerve stimulation, it's a treatment for individuals with moderate to se severe obstructive sleep apnea who cannot tolerate CPAP. So the hypoglossal nerve stimulator is in essence a device that basically activates the hypoglossal nerve, which is a nerve that controls the tongue. And in essence, what it does is that with each inspiration, it actually activates the tongue to move forward. So if you look on this image here to the right, you can see this individual sleeping on their back. Right here is the actual implant. So that's the actual stimulator. This breathing sensor is placed in the fourth rib space and it's superficial where it detects breathing effort. So when the device detects that the individual is inhaling, it basically activates the implant to then send a signal up this electrode here, which is then wrapped around the nerve that controls the tongue, which is the hypoglossal nerve, to move the tongue forward and open up the airway, right? And that's how it's helping to, in essence, prevent the obstructive sleep apnea events from happening. It's a very safe outpatient procedure that's performed by ear, nose, and throat surgeons very fast and quick recovery time. Majority of my patients that have had the implant implanted, usually within the first end of the first week, they've uh, all reported that their pain was very minimal and they've recovered. There's very little restrictions after surgery as well. The implant typically is activated and managed by your sleep physician. So the ENT helps to you know, implant it and then we're the ones in sleep medicine that will actually turn the device on and then determine what settings are needed to treat you successfully. So as mentioned, it's a very safe outpatient procedure. It's done in an outpatient surgery center. Usually you go home the same day and typically it can take about two hours for the actual procedure. It's inserted through two small two inch or five centimeter incisions. So if you look here on this image here, there's one two inch incision right here in the right upper chest wall where they create a little pocket to insert the, the implant. And this is an image of the implant here. It's about a two inch implant and it's maybe at most about a less than a centimeter in thickness. Then they actually tunnel this breathing sensor to the fourth rib space. So that's where, of course, that is gonna be detecting your breathing effort. And then they tunnel this electrode here without making any incisions along this area. They tunnel it up to this area here along the right jawline here where they make another two inch incision. And that's where they're able to locate and attach the electrode to the nerve that controls the tongue, which is the hypoglossal nerve. So there's about a two inch incision here and then one two inch incision here. Typically pain control is generally by over-the-counter pain meds. One of the surgeons we work with here locally in Scottsdale, he typically prescribes Celebrex and all my patients have uh, generally done quite well. Like I mentioned, most individuals have reported very minimal uh, pain issues apart from pain at the incision sites. Um, you can return to non-strenuous activity within a few days after surgery. Many patients will ask, well, does the battery run out? And it is a pacemaker uh, implant, so it has an average battery life of about 11 hours. It does last a bit longer than a cardiac pacemaker because this implant is only turned on when you're sleeping, whereas a cardiac pacemaker is on 24 hours a day. So as a result, the battery life does last a bit longer with the Inspire implant. Uh, MRI of the head, neck, and extremities can be safely performed. And the device also tracks adherence, which means that we're able to pull a report from the implant and it will show us how many nights a week you're using it, how long each night, what setting you're actually on as well. So how does that actually work? Let's watch this video here, which will kind of show a demonstration of what a patient with Inspire would typically do when they're about to go to bed. So we'll take the remote control there and they'll activate the implant. So when the individual's breathing, 
this sensor here detects inhalation and then it activates the tongue to move forward. You can see here how the tongue is being moved forward. And that's how it's helping to treat the obstructive sleep apnea, and that's just trying to prevent it from actually happening. So let's take a look at some more detailed views in terms of what exactly is happening before stimulating with the hypervalsal nerve implant to mimic exactly what's happening when a person has an obstructive sleep apnea event versus what happens when we actually activate the tongue to move forward with the implant. So the first video here on the left is going to be what's happening with the base of the tongue in the setting of untreated sleep apnea. So you can see that dark opening there, that's in essence your airway. You can see that it's quite small, right? You can imagine how much air this person is likely pulling in with such a small airway. This is just showing what's happening at the level of the soft palate, which would be up here. Okay, and you can barely see any airway. So, so again, you can imagine how little air they're getting in and how low their oxygen must be dropping while they're sleeping. Now on the right side, this is the same patient, but now under the influence of the hypoglossal nerve stimulator or the Inspire implant, and we'll be able to see the differences in terms of when the implant activates the tongue to move forward, you'll be able to see how wide the airway opens up both at the base of the tongue as well as the level of the soft palate. There, you can see how wide the airway is. So every time this space opens up, that's when the tongue is activated to move forward. And we'll look at the level of the soft palate. Again, the same thing. Every time you see everything open up, that's when the implant is activating the tongue and the soft palate to rise and open. You can just see how wide the airway is. So what are the criteria for being a candidate for Inspire? So first off, you must be at least 18 years of age or older, must be diagnosed with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, and the AHI, which is the measure of how frequently a person is having a sleep apnea event, must be no less than 15 episodes per hour, up to 65 episodes per hour. And typically, most insurance companies want to see what this number is within the last 24 months. So if you haven't had a baseline sleep study performed within the last 24 months, then we would have to complete that first to make sure you meet this criteria before we can move further. There has to be a documentation of either failure to CPAP therapy or difficulty tolerating CPAP therapy. There has to be an airway exam, which is done by ENT. And then also if you have central sleep apnea, less than 25% of the total number of events that a person is having must be central events. So majority of the sleep apnea has to be obstructive. And there's also a BMI restriction. So the body mass index must be less than 35 kilograms per meter squared. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona has a tighter restriction of less than 32 kilograms per meter squared. So, what is the procedure in terms of if a person says, okay, I'm ready to move forward with Inspire, how does the whole process work? So first off, of course, we have to make sure that you meet all those criteria that I just showed in the previous slide. If you do, then we would get you over to ENT and there's you know, a handful of ENT surgeons that are certified to implant Inspire. They have to do an exam that's called the drug induced sleep endoscopy. That's where they'll have you come into the outpatient surgery center. And they'll, put you, they'll give you propofol to, in essence, induce sleep. And with the camera, they'll take a look at the back of your throat to see how is your airway collapsing. Is it predominantly your tongue and soft palate that's obstructing the airway? That's a favorable situation, so then you're a candidate. But if the examination shows that your tongue, soft palate collapse, but then also the side walls of your throat also collapse, which is what we call concentric collapse, then unfortunately, you're not a candidate because Inspire cannot help to open up the side walls of the throat. Majority of individuals are in the favorable, favorable situation of having what we call anterior postural collapse, which is your tongue and the soft palate collapsing. Once you're implanted, 30 days later, you would meet with a sleep physician. That's when we would turn the device on for the first time. If you're still using CPAP when you're going through this process, then we would typically still have you use CPAP you know, as best you can until you come in for your activation visit. The day of the activation visit, obviously we would meet here in person in clinic. That's when we're gonna turn on the implant, like I said, but then we're gonna determine a few initial settings. 
the first setting is what we call the sensational threshold. That's when you would feel some level of sensation when we turn the implant on. And then the second setting is what we call the functional threshold, which is where we would see your tongue actually move forward in the appropriate fashion. And then that kind of gives us a starting range of 10 settings that we would set your remote control in the implant to, and then educate you on how to self titrate, so to speak, the implant. The way the process works with Inspire versus say with CPAP, with CPAP we can bring you into the sleep lab, we can titrate you or determine what pressure is needed to treat your sleep apnea right then and there, set the device to the set pressure and we know that all right, as long as you're using it, tolerating it, your sleep apnea is controlled. With Inspire it's a bit different than that. We wanna take 90 days across after the activation visit to allow the throat muscle, the tongue muscle to get adjusted to the way this activation is because it's a very novel type of uh, stimulation. So we give you a range of about 10 settings and every third night, fourth night, depending upon how you're feeling and tolerating it, we just advise you to go up by one level. And we're going to see you in clinic every two weeks for follow-up visit to download the remote control to show how many nights a week you're using it, how long each night, what setting you're on, but then also to see how you're doing. So the first 90 days are going to be more just getting the tongue and all the other muscles at, adjusted to this form of stimulation. Most individuals, usually by the end of you know month two, going into month three, they're already noticing that they're sleeping better, they're feeling a bit better rested, their spouses or bed partners are noticing that they're snoring you know, has improved or even resolved. So it's not that you're gonna be going 90 days after we turn it on still being symptomatic without using a CPAP or any other treatment. It's just a slow guided, uh, you know, basically working out of the, of the tongue muscle. Once we get to the 90 day mark, if things appear to be clinically good, meaning that you, you're tolerating it without any pain, discomfort, you feel that, hey, you know what, I'm sleeping better. I do feel better during the day when I wake and during the daytime, I'm not snoring then we'd schedule your sleep study where we'd have you come into the sleep lab and that's when we observe you sleeping with Inspire on and dial in exactly what voltage setting is needed to treat you specifically. So then we know objectively that at this setting, this person's sleep apnea is the way it needs to be. The oxygen level is remaining above 88% and the quality of sleep is uh, where it needs to be. And then we'd see you about every six months after that, typically about a year after the first sleep study, we'd repeat your sleep study to confirm that Inspire is still properly treating the sleep apnea. Because one of the uh, limitations of Inspire right now is that it doesn't measure how frequently you're having sleep apnea events with the implant. Like a CPAP machine can record how many events you're having, the Inspire implant cannot record that. So we have to repeat the study about every year to confirm that the sleep apnea is well controlled. And then after that, we just continue following you as we would if you're on a CPAP. So activation visit, I kind of already went through all the details there, but in essence, I'll show you this video, which kind of just demonstrates. And this is a tablet that we use to activate the, the actual implant. You can see the physician ask the patient to go supine for this visit. You can see the telemetry wand here placed over the device. That allows the physician to use the programmer to communicate with the patient. And all the physician did there was find the amplitude which provided effective and comfortable settings. The physician is also instructed to review the book one more time and make sure the patient has a good basic understanding of how to use the remote and remind the patient that the book is the resource to use if they are unclear about the functionality of the sleep remote. The telemetry wand allows the sleep technician to do the study completely from the control room. No need to interrupt the patient. And then you can see the, the tech will go here in just a minute, pick up the stylus, and in response to watching the sleep study, make a subtle adjustment in amplitude and hit save. That's it. Subtle adjustments and amplitude to get to the best amplitude to effectively treat that patient's sleep apnea. Very simple, very straightforward. That's what the sleep study is all about. So that video was just demonstrating what we do at that 90 day mark when we bring you into the sleep study where the sleep technician will be making small adjustments on the implant while you're asleep remotely. So we can dial in exactly what voltage is needed or amplitude is needed to treat the sleep apnea effectively. But like I mentioned, majority of individuals, by the time they get ready for the sleep study, most of those individuals are pretty close to where they need to be from what I've observed in my patient population uh, of where they need to be for that final setting. 
So in terms of um, the clinical research and the results, so there's a lot of clinical research that's been published on Inspire. The, there was a 2014 study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a pivotal trial that resulted in the FDA approving Inspire to be used to treat moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. But since then, there's been over 100 peer review publications. There's five-year follow-up data, meaning that the individuals that were in this clinical trial here that was published in the English Journal of Medicine, those individuals were followed for five years to see how they were doing. Uh, there's also an adhere registry where they're enrolling up to 5,000 patients uh, globally and following these individuals long-term as well to track how well are these individuals being treated with regards to their sleep apnea, but how well are they feeling with regards to daytime tiredness. From an insurance coverage standpoint, most insurance providers are covering Inspire. I honestly have not come across a patient yet with an insurance that was not able to get approved for Inspire therapy, ranging from Medicare uh, to commercial insurance plans. So the STAR trial here, that's that pivotal trial that was produced, uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a five-year follow-up data. So what this means, the graph here on the left shows how severe was the sleep apnea in the 126 patients that were enrolled in this study. So the average severity level was in the moderate, just on the border of severe obstructive sleep apnea, where they had an average of 29 events per hour, meaning that the throat was collapsing about 29 times an hour. After the first year, when they repeated their sleep study, after utilizing Inspire therapy, it had come down to nine times an hour. At three years, it had improved even further to six times an hour. And at five years, they were still around six times an hour. So dramatic improvement from without Inspire therapy to with Inspire therapy. And you can see that even five years after they were implanted, their sleep apnea was still very well controlled. Here on the right shows in terms of their daytime sleepiness. So the baseline level of daytime sleepiness, their upward sleepiness scale was 11, which is significant daytime sleepiness. After being implanted and five years down the road, you can see that their average level of daytime sleepiness actually was normal, uh, meaning that their upper sleepiness score was six at one year, three year, and five year, meaning that because their sleep apnea was consistently well controlled with Inspire, they felt great during the day and their daytime sleepiness had continued to be resolved. So let me share some of my own patients, uh, just to give you an example of some of the cases that I've had and, and what their situation was that resulted in them having Inspire implanted and what their outcome was. So we'll review Ms. Gigi first. She was diagnosed with severe obstructive sleep apnea with a severity of 37 events per hour. She had significant daytime sleepiness on her initial visit. She scored 20, which is quite high. Normal should be less than eight, which is that how likely you are to fall asleep in various different scenarios. She had very broken sleep and was sleeping all day long as per her daughter, who's also a surgical RN. She had tried CPAP therapy, but really struggled with trying to find a mask that fit well for her. And she just struggled keeping it on during the night. So as a result of it, she couldn't treat it. And with the severity level, she had really limited options. She was evaluated for Inspire and she was implanted uh, on July 8th, 2020. We did her sleep study with Inspire about three months later. And you can see that at a voltage setting of 2.6 volts, her sleep apnea events went from 37 times an hour down to 9.2 times an hour. So significant improvement. But you can see that her level of daytime sleepiness dropped from 20 down to four. And she reported that she was sleeping through the night. She wasn't waking up to go to the bathroom. She wasn't having very fragmented sleep. And she was awake during the day. Previously, she was actually falling asleep while she was having her breakfast. She was falling asleep while she was talking to her daughter. She just couldn't keep herself awake during the day. And after Inspire, she was sleeping through the night, waking, feeling rested, and actually you know, rested throughout the entire day. And mind you, this individual actually is in her late 70s. Um, so she did very, very well, and she was very happy with the fact that she could stay awake during the day and sleep through the night. So another patient of mine, Mrs. PT, so she was diagnosed with moderate obstructive sleep apnea with a severity index of 25 per hour in 2016. She was on CPAP therapy when she came to see me back in 2016, and she was using it well. I mean, she was very compliant, adherent, but she struggled with trying to find a mask that fit perfect for her. She 
felt better with CPAP therapy compared to not using CPAP therapy, but there was still room for improvement in terms of the way she could feel during the daytime. And the problem was, is we tried multiple different masks and just because of her facial structure, we couldn't find that perfect mask that didn't leak at all. Even though the sleep apnea was very well controlled with the CPAP, the low level leak that she kept having still kept affecting quality of sleep. And that still kept her from feeling as well rested as I knew she potentially could. So we tried for about two years to find a mask that would leak for her. And I tried everything um, and, and she was willing to work with me on it, which was great. But ultimately I had kind of run out of options from a mask standpoint and what combinations we could try. So we decided to pursue Inspire. So she was implanted last June. And ultimately when we did her sleep study in November, because of the pandemic, there was a little bit of a longer uh, time stretch there, but with an amplitude of 2.7 volts, her sleep apnea severity went from 25 times an hour to 1.3. So really remarkable result. And she was sleeping through the night uninterrupted without having to use sleep aids. And she actually felt better rested than she did when she was using CPAP. And she actually felt better rested throughout the rest of the day as well. So she was very, very happy. And obviously I was happy that she was actually feeling better. And none of my patients to date so far, and I probably have closer to about maybe 50 to 60 patients in our practice with Inspire. And none of my patients have regretted getting Inspire uh, so far, which is obviously very important for me because I wanted to make sure that I was recommending, you know, a, a very good treatment option for this patient population. So this slide here actually is our patient data as of uh, today. And you can see that the treatment outcomes in terms of the severity level for the individuals that are currently implanted, 35, and there's more individuals in there that haven't been loaded, so our number actually is higher than this, but you can see that the severity level is in the severe category at about 32 events per hour, and for the 22 patients that have already completed their sleep study, you can see that it came down to less than five times an hour, so our results actually have been really great. We've been very happy. The level of daytime sleepiness also was right around eight. So still a little bit on the you know uh, level of fatigue, but you can see that after Inspire, they dropped down to just under six times an hour. And then even utilization. So these individuals are averaging about 7.2 hours per night of usage of, the, of Inspire therapy. So they're actually using it for pretty much the entire time they're sleeping, which is far better than what the national average is with CPAP. So here's a gentleman uh, who actually I met a couple of years ago, and it was uh, hearing his story that actually really kind of pushed me over the edge, so to speak, to actually start considering this as a treatment option for, for my patient population. Uh, his name is Randy Livingston, and here's his phone number. He's happy to speak to uh, any of you that are actually interested in learning more. So his pre-inspire severity was 28 events per hour. So just on the border of severe sleep apnea, after he was implanted and had a study, it dropped down to four times an hour. So really remarkable result. And he had your classic story of loud snoring, waking, gasping, exhausted during the day, falling asleep all the time. And then with inspire, with his apnea being very well controlled, obviously his girlfriend was happy that he wasn't snoring. He wasn't stopping breathing. He was actually sleeping through the night felt better rested when he woke in the morning and felt great throughout the day and wasn't falling asleep uh, during the daytime. And in fact, also he lost some weight as well because he was getting better quality sleep and that helped him. So, so all in all, it was, a, it was a great story, but most of my patients have also have uh, similar stories like this. So if you're interested in scheduling an appointment with us, here's our office phone number. Uh, you can also go online to our website and request an appointment or even email uh, at this email address here, info at sleeplessinarizona.com if you're interested in uh, being evaluated for Inspire. If you've had prior sleep studies, please bring those with you or have them sent to our office so we can review those. Uh, in Scottsdale, uh, myself and Dr. Stacy Gunn, we are accepting new patients to evaluate for Inspire. In our Gilbert office, we've got two physicians there also, Dr. Uh, Anupama Ramalingam and Dr. Francisco Rawls. Both are also uh, utilizing Inspire therapy as well and evaluating new patients uh, in, the, in our Gilbert location. And this just shows where our offices are located. And if you have any questions, just let us know. Uh, Lori is uh, on the call and she can answer any questions as well. Uh, and if you would like to speak to a, a patient that has Inspire, also let us know too. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. And if you all are interested in having us contact you to schedule an appointment, you can just raise your hand in the Q&A section and I'll have someone from Dr. Patel's office reach out to you. Um, so at this time, please feel free to type in questions. Dr. Patel, thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a great, great. night. Thank you.